G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. Joining me as always, Scott Colley, the original car expert, he's back. Hello, Sean. The original car expert's yeah. a good name, I think. I, I think might put so. that in a business card. I think, I think so. Feel free to put it in your uh, email as well. So <laughs> if you email Scott, you might get that as a response. Uh, and back from her little holiday, Jay Credencina. How was your break, Jay? It was so good. I uh, also enjoyed last week's episode. So shout out to Jack. He did very yeah, well. Yeah, Jack did a great job. So um, He's coming for that seat. Be careful. Yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> He's trying to find ways to get rid of you. So look out. <laughs> it's time to watch you back. Uh, look, we've got a big episode this week. We're going to be talking about Australia's public charging infrastructure, uh, some funky new number plates that are coming out of the United States, and the brand new MG4 from China. We're going to have a chat about that a bit later on. So stick around for that. But let's get straight into it. Um, Hyundai have said that the public charging network in Australia is unacceptable and I am finding it hard to disagree with them <laughs> about that. Uh, long story short, uh, companies Charge Fox and EV are in charge of rolling out uh, charging infrastructure across Australia. They're two of the big companies They're that are taking the on the project. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's also next to no accountability when you pull in to charge your electric car and they're not working, which seems to be the case a lot of the time. But Scott, you actually wrote the article on this. So give us a bit more background. Yeah, so we sat down with Hyundai last week for an update on pretty much everything electric in their world. That was pricing on the new Ionic, but they also did cover off on the state of charging in Australia. And what essentially they're calling for is something like what they've got in the UK, where you need to have 99% uptime on any public charger. You need to be able to pay with a credit card that isn't linked to an app or an account and need to tell people what it's going to cost to charge without forcing them to sign up for some app or company that, you know, tracks their data. So, so like how a petrol station works. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. Funny that. Um, but more broadly, I mean, the challenge is with these chargers, it's still fairly new technology. And although a lot of the chargers are actually built in Queensland by a company called Tritium, they're not necessarily built always for Australian conditions because the big customers for these chargers are in Europe and the US. They need to work everywhere in the world, and sometimes the stuff that works best in Europe doesn't work best here. Um, what sort of experience have you guys had with these charges? Have you rolled up to broken ones? Have you seen big queues? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Yeah. I was going to say, let's ask Mr. V8 himself. <laughs> yes, Ford XR8 um, charging. So uh, if you drive Sydney to Melbourne, Melbourne, uh, Sydney to Brisbane, those sort of main uh, highways, it's not an issue. They're everywhere. Every server you pull into, you get fast charges. But uh, last year, we did a drive with an EV6 from Adelaide to Sydney uh, through the back country of New South Wales, basically. Um, we stayed in a town called Hay. Mm -hmm. There was one free NRMA charger. It's 20 kilowatts. Yep. And it was fine. We were able to pull in. We spent the night there, so plugged the car in. It charged overnight. We got going the next day. But if you pulled in there, if you came in on a weekend, and there was six people with their Teslas there waiting to charge it. You'd be there for hours yeah. before you get a charge. And it's the same in almost all those small towns because the councils are actually giving out grants to put them in, but you know, they're one 20 kilowatt charger or the NRMAs put them in. And I think that, yes, we have often found broken ones when we've gone to charge press cars, but also when you do travel, it's, yeah, you really need to think about giving yourself enough time in these places to charge it. But what about you, Joe? Have you found that? Well, I recently, um, on my break last week, um, had the chance to drive an EV for a full week. Right, so you were working I'd never on done your before. break. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, never stop. And, um, <laughs> That's not like it's it was, a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, and it was actually really cool to understand my local charging infrastructure, but also when, because we went out for a day to film, the car that we had, um, and it was good to be able to find these charges everywhere and see the thing in Sydney that I would say, and again, this is just based on seven days, long term, it could be different. Um, charges were maybe 20 kilometers away from each other, 10, 15, 20 kilometers away from each other, which is fine, but they were always taken. They worked, they weren't expensive, but they were always taken. So I remember waking up at 6.30 just to be able to go down to the local shopping centre to charge the car that we had, to then go home, come back once the car was fully charged and I got a notification on the app. So it works, it's good, but there's a lot of like limitations and restrictions at the moment that I think if we're going to be, I totally understand where Hyundai is coming from, and if we're going to be adopting electric cars, we need to be better. It is interesting you mention the shopping centre and you mention a local council and I'm talking about Charge Fox and Evie. I think that is one of the challenges they face. 
Ultimately, Shell, although it franchises it, operates a Shell petrol station. The petrol comes from Shell, the bowsers are installed by Shell, and if something goes wrong, Shell looks after it, or the franchise operator looks after it. With these electric car chargers, there are a lot of moving parts. So, I mean, we say ChargeFox is rolling out the infrastructure, and it is. ChargeFox does do some of the installation and that sort of thing, but it's possible to have an EV charger that is operated by the RACV, that was installed and maintained by Charge Fox using parts from tri tritium in Queensland and maybe cables and plugs from ABB in Germany. And if one step on that chain doesn't talk to the other, or maybe something goes wrong at one end of the chain, there are a lot of moving parts that need to sort of work together to fix it. And I think we're still at the young stage where those moving parts aren't quite as locked in as maybe they need to be. Well, so a couple of quick stats here. Um, as of the start of 2023, there was around 2,400 public charging locations in Australia, uh, offering around 4,900 uh, individual plugs. Now, for what it's worth, I've seen photos uh, in the States of uh, a Tesla charger at an uh, interstate service station, and there's 100 yeah. chargers there. Like, yeah. it's, such a, it's such a different level over there. Um, as of, Again, at the start of 2023, there was only 99 ultra-fast charging stations yeah. in Australia, which... Um, considering all of these cars that do actually run electricity need, they have big batteries and they need to charge quickly, that's kind of not good enough. No. Well, so that is the difference between fast chargers and really fast chargers. I mean, if we're talking about a 25 kilowatt charger, which is one of the levels that's mentioned in the report Sean's working from here, if you've got a car with a 75 kilowatt hour battery, so let's say a higher end Tesla Model 3 has roughly that, on a 25 kilowatt charger from empty to full, it's gonna take you three hours, provided that charger is working at full speed. On a 100 kilowatt charger, it's gonna take three quarters of an hour. And on a 350 kilowatt charger, depending on how fast the car can draw, you come down towards half an hour or 20 minutes. So although there are fast chargers relative to plugging into a three pin socket in the wall, this term kind of means more than just petrol station style stop. It could mean anything from hour long top up to 20 minutes splash and dash. And, and that I think also is something that customers and owners of new electric cars will come to terms with. Yeah. They'll start looking at the number on the Charge Fox app or the EV app or the NRMA app or whatever it is to understand how long they need to be there. But they're really important distinctions that at the moment we don't have to think about because the only real difference at a petrol station is diesel or high flow diesel. Yeah. It takes the same amount of time. And it's interesting, Jade, you mentioned going to a, a mall earlier to yeah. charge it. And I, I remember having a similar experience in Sydney last year where I drove down, I went, okay, I'm going to charge this um, plug-in hybrid that I had. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch of Teslas there charging and I was like, oh, there's a free spot, perfect. I'll pull in. I was going to go do some shopping anyway, spend a couple of hours. Uh, nothing, it just didn't work. Yeah. It's just, it, and there's no sign to say it's not working. It just didn't work. Well, one thing that we had as well is the capability of the actual plugs. That was one thing that we ran into. The charger worked. It was free, got there. This was actually up in the Hunter Valley where there's one or two chargers. So <laughs> I feel like it's make or break. It's and weird because it's cold country up there. They well, should have plenty of electricity. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and I'm not the engaging pin, with that. <laughs> the pin didn't fit into the car. Ah, so yeah. I was like, okay, well, thankfully, you know, we didn't actually need to charge. It was just because the space was free and the car park was empty that we were like, we'll just park there and charge up for whatever we need. But we couldn't even, like if I needed charge, I genuinely would have had to have the car towed because there was no other option there and there was no power outlet to plug into the wall there anywhere. Um, so yeah, it's, Look, I do it's think tough. The one positive from all of this is that this wouldn't be a problem if there were only three electric cars in Australia like there was a couple of years ago. Yeah. So ultimately this problem does also mean that we are selling more electric cars, people are buying them and adopting them. And the fact that it's happened so quickly means there are gonna be some growing pains, but there's been tens of thousands of electric cars sold this year in Australia. And that's tens of thousands of people who at some point will need to interact with this infrastructure. That wave of complaints isn't gonna go unnoticed by big charging companies and big providers that ultimately are funded by taxpayer dollars, but also by regular people who need to rely on these services. So I do think we're in the, the growing pains phase at the moment, but the fact we're there compared to where we were a couple of years ago is a positive. And I reckon in 12 months time, if we are having this conversation again, hopefully it's a bit of a different one. And I think before people get in the Facebook comments and start saying, oh, there's only 2% of cars on the road that are electric. Uh, that's like a lot said, of cars though. Like, that's, that's a lot of cars. That's yeah. a lot of that cars. That is a lot of cars. Considering there's 13 million registered cars, 2% of 13 million is quite a lot. Um, 
you know, where we were, like you said, three years ago, there was only three electric cars yeah. on the road. Now there are thousands. I mean, Tesla are delivering a couple of thousand Model Ys a month. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, going forward, the argument of the servos waiting to for the electric car adoption, that doesn't count anymore. Yeah. They should just be installing it. Yeah. Why BP and Shell have not widely adopted that yet? Is They're getting there, but it's slow. Out. But surely that's a yeah. moneymaker for them at this mm -hmm. point. Surely there's enough cars, electric cars on the road traveling now that it's worth it for them. Well, do you want to share with the world, maybe I'm going to share with the world my grand idea. Go on. Ooh. It's it's every set of traffic lights has a little thing that drops down like it's on top of a tram <laughs> and cars have a port on top of them right. and you just get a quick top up and then the light goes green and it lifts up and away you it's go. It's like air, air refueling like, in a plane. Exactly, <laughs> in a plane. If you think about where we're in Docklands, and I don't mean this is a serious idea, by the way, uh, just to be really clear. Yes. I think it'll be, I think you're onto something. Oh, if, there we no, go, no, maybe it's a serious so idea. Like the, I'm still not familiar with the freeways around here, but the East Link and long freeways if you can plug <laughs> like a, real like a dodging car, style. like a tram, yeah. Yeah, and then that charger goes all the way through to the <laughs> other side. That's like half an hour, 40 minutes in peak hour traffic. Though. The traffic lights around here, we're in Docklands in Melbourne at the moment because of all the roadworks going on. I sat at the traffic lights for 15 minutes last yeah. night on my way home. To charge your car. Could have charged my car. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, if you'd like to have a look at some of the new electric cars coming onto the Australian market, Jade has the event coming up that uh, gives you an opportunity to do it. So, Jade, tell us a little bit I'm about it. I'm very excited. Um, we are actually, today, we're going to announce two uh, cars that are going to join yeah. us, and they're both electric. So, the MG4 and the Renault Megane E-Tech are going to be joining us on the 14th of October. So, if you haven't gotten your tickets, they are free. The coffee cart is confirmed. Coffee will be flowing. The whole team bar... These two individuals will be there. <laughs> yes. um, I'm going to be in Queensland. I'm yeah, really sorry. But it's, it's you know, we've got Jack, James, Will, um, Paul's going to be there. So it's going to be a really good morning um, if you want to come down and meet the team. Um, I will get Sean to put the link to um, register your tickets down below. What's the car you're most excited for? Because I can't wait to see the BMW i5. Yes. That's really exciting for me. I agree. I mean, not that I'm going to be there. I, I'm very much looking forward to the F-150, but... Um, Look, I'm, so I might be lifting the sort of skirts here and giving the secrets away, but the cars are actually going to be here before Saturday. Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, I might have to sneak out the car park and check it out. Um, <laughs> yes, make sure you get your tickets. They are free. I think the co there's some free coffee going that yes, morning as well. Yes, I also forgot to mention, for anyone who does join us on the day, there will be a giveaway. Um, I'm very excited. There are some really cool things going into the giveaway. Giving away a Tesla Model what? <laughs> <laughs> one Model Y for you. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's coming out of Jade's pay, so... Um, <laughs> We're not doing that. Yes, just to be clear. Like and subscribe, so Jake can afford um, to give away a Tesla. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, there'll definitely be a giveaway. We have to be there on the day. Um, and we are going to be also announcing a major sponsor for the event this week. So make sure you're staying tuned to all of our social platforms. Oh, so much to come. So, so just to clarify, it is free. It is yes. free. Yes. Uh, so uh, hit the link in the description to check it out. Um, Jade, you'll have to give us a rundown on it afterwards. Uh, we'll do a catch up after yes. the event. You tell us how it yep. all went. So we're looking for forward sure. to that. Very exciting. Um, now, we're actually, we're going to stick with you for a little bit longer here, Jade, because you broke a, a funny little story out of the United States this week. Uh, an American company called Reviver uh, has developed a digital license plate. Now, we will get into the potential issues with this, but give us a bit of a rundown on it, Jade. Yeah, so um, the reason why uh, we wrote the story is because uh, Ford in America has officially signed to have the digital license plates uh, for customers in Arizona, California, and Michigan. So is this is a dealer option yes. in the States? Wow, yes. okay. Yes, that's why, you know, we were like, oh, this is actually really cool. Yeah. So Ford is the only manufacturer in the world to actually offer this as a dealer accessory. So when customers go in to purchase their car, um, you know, you get to pick slimline plates or you know whichever plates you want you can actually now pick digital plates which is really cool um, there are a few different uh, options for the digital plates um, now they do start and I've converted this already to Australian dollars it's almost a thousand dollars just for the plate alone and then they come with a subscription fee which is just under 150 bucks a year which isn't too bad but I it's think, not great either. No, no <laughs> it, it's it's quite expensive. Now, some cool things. What happens that, if you don't? Sorry, you, what if you don't pay your subscription? Do another plates turn off? They just don't blink. No, no, what no, happens? They don't. But you basically lose a, a lot of features, which I was just about to go into. Okay, so. Um, 
the features that you get when uh, you do have the subscription, um, you can customize the font as well as the color of your number plate. I want my number um, plate with wingdings, please. Yeah. <laughs> you can get uh, additional wording at the bottom, like a team slogan or maybe even your company name. Um, and one cool thing, which I think is cool, but I got a little bit of backlash for this. If the car is reported stolen, which you can do on the app, um, it actually will um, show up a stolen, I guess, sign on the number plate. Oh, nice. So it, it's cool. kind of like a secret alarm where if the person that has stolen your car doesn't really realise that the digital number plates are digital, mm. um, police and everyone around them will realise that the car is stolen. It also has GPS tracking built into the number plate. So pretty cool stuff. What do you guys think? I actually remember reporting on something like this a couple of years ago when I worked for a tech website and there was talk about using it for advertising. So if your car is parked and stationary for a couple of hours, you can earn money by, in that area, local businesses putting slogans on your car, which is kind of terrifying as an idea, but also kind of a cool way to make some cash from your car on the side. Yeah. I actually really like it. And I think somewhere like the States where there are I suppose they're more relaxed about what you can and can't do with your number plates. There's a lot of people who get around already with custom frames. Each yeah. state has its own interesting design. You don't need front plates either. Yeah, half the, half the states don't actually yeah. have plates on the car at all. So. It's, a, it's a really cool idea that I wouldn't mind seeing roll out in Australia. The only thing that worries me about Australia is knowing the way that our like licensing and registration bodies work, they'll see it as a cash cow and start charging a lot more than 150 bucks a year for it. I would like to point out, I'm not an AFL person, but I, I would like to see how many people all year have their AFL team on the number plate. That and then when cool. it gets down to the grand final, yeah. they all change it. To <laughs> <Yes>. the, <laughs> <they want> to. <laughs> I'd also like, and this is stolen from Top Gear, but if you're on the road and you've got a passenger with the app to send messages to the car <laughs> behind you, yeah, that stop would be tailgating cool. me, please. Yeah. So I'm curious though, um, generally, these people that make these products mm. are very smart, but the people that want to hack into them are generally smarter, <laughs> yes. or at least more determined. Yeah, and I, yeah, that's my concern: is is how uh, how safe are they? Like, surely, if you can change all that stuff through an app, then if someone wants to get into it, they can get into it and actually alter the plates. Like, this seems like. It seems like there's opportunity there, definitely. Yeah. I do think, though, number plates are not the. I mean, we learnt this recently with a press car that had number plates stolen from it. Allegedly. Uh, the existing, different story, <laughs> the existing system we have for number plates is not the most secure thing in the world anyway. I mean, they're just held on with screws, and if you really want to, you can lift them off pretty much any car. Mm. Um, yes, there is definitely the opportunity for hacking there, but I still think if we're talking about a simpler way to mess with people's plates, it's always going to be easier to get a crowbar and rip it off the front of a car than it is to do lots of lines of code and hack into someone's app to change one letter on their number plate or put something lewd on there. Mm. Yeah, and you've always got the VIN. So, like, regardless of what's on the number play, the car will still be able to be identified in some shape or form anyway. So, yes, it can be hacked, but a people a hacker's going to jump to that opportunity before a bank or something else, probably not. Maybe they just don't want to pay their tolls, you know. <laughs> so, that's actually a great I, 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 idea. That's what I'd probably be so inclined to do. What would you guys have on a personalised plate? I'm anti-personalised plate. Yeah, I, I just would. think they're completely unnecessary, but I am curious to know what you'd do if you had to do it. Oh, it'd have to be something cheeky, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, agree. You know, like the, how many times have we had a story written on the website where it's like, this plate's been banned <laughs> yeah. because like, yeah. someone wrote something cheeky. Yeah. This would be your way around it because the plate is the plate. That's mm. all, all well and good. But then you put a cheeky slogan on there. Down I don't the know bottom what instead. It would be, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's. I definitely want to have some fun with that. I just want wingdings. Can I, can I have my number plate in, in indecipherable <laughs> scroll? I did, Jade and I were messaging about this yesterday and I said, it's the Jilted X lovers ultimate oh, yeah, tra I love trap, that. isn't it? Yeah. Guys must have lost me from the group chat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you were busy. Uh, but yes, no, it's uh, not great if your Jilted X lover has access to the app. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do not trust this man. Cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, look, let us know. Uh, leave a comment. Let us know. Do you agree with the idea of digital license plates? Uh, if you do agree with it, how would you have it? And if you don't, tell us why. What, what do you think could be the problem with it? Now, Jade, I'm curious. You've been quite busy lately. Do you find that you have much spare time outside of work to do anything? 
No. No? Where, where does this come from? What, about, <laughs> what about you, Scott? Do you have much spare time outside sure. of work? I also have been busy at work and I have very little <laughs> spare time. So I'm curious, if you were considering buying a new car, would you have time to go and look at a bunch of different dealerships? Chad's now on board with where this I is going. Now, I understand the assignment. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, and I'm, that's not me just saying that. Well, Genuinely lucky for no. you, we've put them all in one place at Help Me Car Expert. It's very simple. You head to Google, you type in Help Me Car Expert, and that will take you to a page where there's lots of pictures of Paul and he'll help you find a new car, get a great deal and connect you to a dealer all over the country. We can we can connect you to a dealer no matter where you are. So head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert and we'll take a lot of the time and hassle out of trying to buy a brand new car. If you do use Help Me Car Expert, leave a comment, let us know how was the experience and what car did you buy? All right, guys, it's the big one. We've all been, actually, we've all Drum been waiting roll, for this please. for a long time. Um, this is probably one of the most uh, hyped up cars in this office for quite a while now. Which is... Again, if we were having this conversation 12 months ago, I wouldn't have believed it's a Chinese electric hatchback. Um, yes, it is the MG4. Yeah. It's been really keen to drive it. I mean, we've had the MG3 for a while. Uh, yeah. Generally, when you go up a number in a car, it's not that different, but this is this very, is very different. different. Like Absolutely. Yeah. So you've both driven it. Yes. Uh, different who wants specs. To talk of... You go first. Okay. I'll I think go you first. had a lower spec. I had the entry level car, okay. yeah. Tell us a bit about it, Scott. So MG4 is. One of those cars that launched in Europe just before it did in Australia, and a lot of people that I know most of us really respect wrote really nice things about it. Um, it's an affordable electric car. It starts at 38,990 in Australia, uh, and when you get rebates in certain states, it's closer to 30 grand. And the range starts at about 350 k's and goes up from there. So it's got a usable range. It's about the same size as a Golf, maybe a little bit bigger. I was expecting it to be dull as dishwater because often these base electric cars are, but this thing really, really impressed me. It's got a really pared back simple interior. It's really easy to sort of operate and use. There's fewer of those quirks that we've had in other Chinese cars with the tech. And then when you drive it, it's rear wheel drive. It's got really lovely steering. It's actually really good fun. I was blown away by it. And it is worth pointing out um, that such a Scott that feels that way, most people in Car Expert that have driven it have felt the same. And honestly, if you look across the industry, it, yeah. no one really has a bad thing to say about it, which I find really fascinating. It's one of those cars, and we, on a, any given week, have between six and ten cars through the Melbourne office to do video on, reviews on, photos of, that sort of thing. And we always chat about what we've driven and how we thought about it, because we're all car nerds. Yeah. And this is one of those cars that universally, someone's handed the keys back and gone, did you really like that? I really liked that. Yeah. That was really good. Um, which sounds like faint praise, but it, it's not. It's just a it's just a really sort of impressive car. I don't know what your experience was in Sydney. But well, I had the um, Excite. So they have an Excite and an Essence. Um, those are the trim levels, but I had the largest battery option, so the 77 kilowatt. MG claims you can get 530 kilometres. I pushed that to about 550, closer to 600. Did you get 600 wow. k's out yeah, of it? Yeah, it was insane. That's amazing. And With re like a lot of regening or? Yeah, well, I put it on maximum regen and I was going through Sydney City, so there was quite a lot of traffic and stuff. The 600 k is a lot of laps in Sydney City. Yeah, yeah, I was actually surprised to beat it, one. And two, like Scott said, it was super comfortable. It had plenty of space for what that size car would be people would expect. I also have jumped on um, a couple of owners pages and everyone is raving about it. Like people who can't wait to pick this up. It, it's such a well-rounded car for the price. I think MG have really like hit the nail on the head with it. I've got two complaints Ooh. because as much as we like it, it's not perfect. Yep. Uh, my first is the adaptive cruise control system. So I drove this uh, after watching my football team lose a game they should have won in the finals, got back to the office late at night and drove it down the coast. Yeah. Um, and the cruise control, whenever there's more than it just a half guilty. turn of the steering wheel, admit, yeah. breaks the car. Yeah. So as soon oh, as it thinks you're going around yeah. a corner, it starts slowing down. Right. And on long sweeping freeway bends, that is really annoying. Yes, yeah, I've been in a few cars recently that yeah. do that. I'm like, no, 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 I'm smarter than you. Yes. Yeah. Stop that. I, I've done this corner at 100k <laughs> yes. an hour plenty of times. We're totally yes. fine. Calm down, mate. Yeah. The other thing that I initially struggled with was the tech. It has, as simple as it is, it's got a few quirks to it. The climate control is hidden on the screen. Um, you've got to go into some sub menus oh, to change certain that's things. That's a very MG thing because like, the HS is similar to that, uh, and it's yeah. and the HS is a hugely popular car. But yeah, yeah they. Well, I don't know why they do the that. The one thing they have done is you can, and we're getting into proper nerd territory yeah. here, but uh, it's got two star buttons on the steering wheel. You can program them to be whatever you want. So I set one of them up to be the brake regen, but the other one can be the climate control. Uh, so yeah. there are still some tech quirks. I still found it a bit awkward to use, but 
the climate control, you press the star, and then you can use this little joystick on the steering wheel to turn up your temperature or fan. Yeah. It's a really clever solution, but it still needs a little bit of fine tuning. So none of them are overly fast. The 77 kilowatts, the fastest zero to 100 at seven seconds. So we're not- 77 kilowatt hour is the battery, by the way, not yeah. the motor. No, Just, no, yeah. but that, that's the fastest uh, yeah. one that you get. So none of them are, are Tesla performance fast, but yes. yeah, it's fast. Yes. There is one coming, I, I'm yeah. led to believe. Yeah, I, um, I haven't seen one yet, driven one yet. I know Tony has in China and he really enjoyed it. It's called the X-Power uh, and it's got the sort of performance you would expect from an A45 AMG Mercedes, something like that. In a car that looks like a Prius C. Well, <laughs> Basically, I, yeah. I did do some uh, comparisons um, and based on the new generation Model 3, is that yep, what we're the, calling the it? The most recently yeah, updated. the most recent. I know Tesla doesn't do generations. Um, it's 6.6, .6, according to Tesla Australia's website, 6.6 .6 seconds from zero to 100. The X Power does that in 3.8 seconds. So the quickest Model 3 will probably be a three and a half second car, something yes. like that, yep. based on the old performance. Tesla yes. hasn't revealed the updated version yep. yet, but they're, they're going to be neck and neck. But exactly what I was going to say. Although it's still higher, I think once Tesla does reveal the Model 3 performance, they are going to be very close. And that car without the X power, it's pretty bloody fast. I do think though the X power might be missing the point. And I'm actually, I'm working on a story about this and I can't quite pull it together. But one of the things that frustrates me about lots of electric cars is they have lots of gimmicks about them. Mm. So we've driven a GWM Aura, for example, which looks like a Chinese, Italian, French, British hatchback. It's got all these classic design cues squished into one. I just actually one. pictured that and right. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Well done. Um, Tesla, I understand, are very simple, but there is still something to that simplicity. They're trying to make a statement. The thing I liked about the MG4 was that it wasn't trying to do anything beyond be a simple electric car. I hopped in it and it worked and it was completely Characterless is maybe a bit mean, but it didn't make a statement. It just did the job. Mm. I want more of that. Mm. I want to have a fun petrol car for the weekend that makes lots of noise and has a manual transmission, but I don't need my electric car to look like a Fiat 500 from the 1960s and have koi fish that pop up on the screen when you turn it on. Yeah. I just want it to work. And I think the base MG4 for the price is the perfect example of what electric cars can be as affordable utilitarian transport. No, I think the Chinese are doing a really good job with a lot of their cars at the moment. As, as we saw, like the Tank 300 is uh, really, really impressive. Uh, this MG4 is really impressive. They've also got the MG5, which is... Petrol a little powered, petrol, not to be, yeah. Yeah, a little, little petrol sedan, but yeah. like quite a good little thing. And I think that... It looks good. It does look really good. Um, and we're going to have reviews dropping on the YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of weeks, so keep an eye out for those. The interesting thing, I know you're about to move on. I'm no, sorry I'm jumping right. in here. The interesting thing is at the moment, that end of the market is dominated by China. We've got the MG3, the BYD Atto 3, the BYD Dolphin is coming. Yeah. There is going to be some competition eventually from the established Korean, Japanese and European brands. Mm -hmm. So... At some point in the nearish future, hopefully, we're going to see a $35,000, $40,000 electric Volkswagen. The ID2 All concept previews that. Um, Hyundai, we understand, we don't know for sure, but could bring the little Casper electric SUV to Australia, which is a cute little $35,000, $40,000 car. Tesla rumoured was working on a cheaper car. Tesla's been well. working on one for a really long time. Yeah. But yeah. Tesla's been working hopefully on at some point. Time. <laughs> yeah, so I think that there's a lot of. Um, space in that market yeah. for it to be a lot more competitive than it is now. And the established brands are coming. They've seen the success of these Chinese brands in Australia, whether it's in the next year or two or a little bit further down the track, I don't know, but we're going to be talking about it more. But no, I think that what the Chinese are doing is really impressive. They're not just building crap anymore. They're actually building cars that are it's actually so quite diplomatically sure. well, no, 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 <laughs> like genuinely, the, you know, the cars are actually quite good now. They're not. Yeah. They, they don't seem to have the issues that they used to have. The build quality Just, has improved. Yeah, they're yes. they're they're all over, it and they've spent a lot of time employing people from legacy car manufacturers to come in and actually help build yeah. these cars. So, look, it's what we saw with the Koreans uh, back in the late nineties and early two thousands yeah. with uh, Kia and Hyundai. I think that's where China's at at the moment. I think. Uh, over the next few years, they're just going to dominate the market if these other guys don't get there. Don't move fast. So, Excuse me, don't move fast. Yeah, so look, MG4, great thing. Uh, I'm curious, I'll throw it out to both of you, which spec would you have? I would have the mid-range with the biggest battery available. Um, I thought that the little battery was okay for me and then I drove from my house to the airport to the office and then 100Ks down the coast and 100Ks back and I was just starting to run out of range. Um, I understand if you have a charger at home, it's a bit different, but my situation doesn't make that practical. So mid-range, 
bigger battery, small wheels, I'd be very happy. Mm. Jade? I, I'd, I'd go everything, ex, everything like Scott said, but I'd go the top long range. So the essence instead of the excitement. No, no, sorry, the um, 77 kilowatt yeah. Uh, battery. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let us know. Uh, leave a comment. Let us know which one would you have uh, or if if you would like a different electric car, let us know that as well. Um, all right. We'll move on to our picks of the week. Uh, Scott, I'll throw it straight to you. I know you've got quite an interesting one. I do. So I cars are one of my passions, but I love golf as well. Please don't fall asleep on me just yet. Um, and the Ryder Cup is this weekend, which is Europe versus America in a pretty significant sort of match they play every year really big sort of football atmosphere. They do an awesome job with it. But it recently threw into my feed something Ryder Cup related, which is the world's longest drive into the back of a moving car. So there's a professional golfer standing on an airstrip and there's a BMW 8 Series sitting next to him, a convertible, and the driver hits the, sorry, the golfer hits the ball and the driver takes off in the 8 Series and catches this ball in the back of the convertible at like, 200 and something k's an hour something insane That's so cool. it sounds ridiculous but it's a really cool video so make sure when sean puts it there you check it out it's very it is very impressive i think there's a lot of <laughs> math that went into it but the yeah. fact that he was able to wallop that ball yeah. and into a moving vehicle i want to know how phenomenal. many takes that took they show a few of the missed attempts there's a broken windscreen at one point as well because they just don't quite get it right I do think for all the maths that goes into it, it just it does come down to man hit ball yes. long way yes. and man drive fast. <laughs> yes. I don't think, it doesn't matter how many takes it took, the fact that he managed to get yes. it really, really impressive. impressive. Yeah, so, Given yeah. I can't hit a fairway. That's, uh, <laughs> look, I, I mean, my golf uh, knowledge extends to mini golf and that's about yeah, it. Yeah, I was so. going to say, pot pot's my thing. <laughs> Volkswagen golf. Uh, yes. Uh, Jade, what's your pick this week? Um, I read an article about it. Um, it was actually a really cool, uh, they're calling it something along the lines of the orange collection. Uh, and it's because eight Aston Martins um, from 2010. So all the cars that Aston Martin produced brand new in 2010 are all going into uh, an auction based on um, a gentleman, in inverted commas, uh, own collection. Now these cars, um, there is a DBS um, convertible, a Spider. So it's, it's every car that Aston made in 2010. Correct. He got one of each in orange. Is yes, that the, is custom... his name Al Bors Fowler? <laughs> he does have, Bors does have an orange vantage. <laughs> Yeah. Coincidentally, the, the buyer wasn't, you know, the seller wasn't identified. Um, <laughs> it did say gentleman, though. It did say gentleman. So it was now, was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, He did a custom orange colour and a custom interior orange to match the exterior. Oh, wow. Like, it, you have to go and see it. Um, it's it, just like a Jaffa. It def, it's just if James Bond was a wordworks like. worker. <laughs> like, it, it's crazy. Um, now, the thing that I thought was a bit weird, um, well, not weird, but... Anyway, I'll let you guys decide. Um, eight cars, hardly any of them have done any kilometres. I think off the top of my head, it was about 140 kilometres on um, one of the cars was the highest mileage. Um, they're going for 680,000 euros. So in Australian dollars, it's 1.1 million for the whole collection. Cheap as chips. That's actually not bad for or a rip off. What I do think you think? It's a rip off because you can get a bunch of oranges, even though things are expensive, like three or four bucks oh, at the supermarket. <laughs> do they what have V8s and V12s? I don't know. They don't. Yeah. They're vitamin B12s. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that counts, right? Um, no, if I were having an Aston Martin, it would need to be a subtle colour. Yeah. Either because, silver or like British Racing Green, right? Right. You've got the to proper James like Bond or yeah. Gentleman Racer spec. Yeah. I don't know that I need it to look like a high vis vest. Yeah, no, I agree. It's I mean, you can wrap it for 1.1 mil for eight no, Aston Martins. I don't know that that's that good of a deal. Well, you don't, don't wrap know. a Aston Martin. No, I know Aston you don't, Martin, but like, <laughs> yeah, the orange interior you can't change. So. It would also clash with my garage. <laughs> so. <That's a> shame. Garages, <laughs> 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 it's your on street parking. <laughs> Sort of, we'll go with that. I can't permit, remember explaining it now. holder on yeah, street correct. parking. All right, I've got a quick question you, for you guys. If you had $620,000 to buy any car, yep. what would you buy? Colin N. Okay. 911 GT3 with a manual. See, I think we you're both that wrong. Was yeah, that's I think my answer. You're both completely wrong. Right. Uh, because those cars are all well and good, but they only drive on the road. Yep. Now, what I discovered this week is uh, Toby Price's Mitsubishi Triton mm. trophy truck is for sale uh, on car sales for $620,000. It has a six litre naturally aspirated V8. Yep. It has 60 centimetres of suspension travel. Which is impressive, yep. It won Fink three times on the truck. Yep, is it um, road legal? It doesn't matter. 
What? Uh, no, what that, that's is, a no. When, the, that's police, a yeah. when no. the police start chasing you, you just drive off the road. <laughs> Which we don't recommend no. doing, kids. Follow no. all the laws. <laughs> but genuinely, the fact that the, a trophy truck that with that kind of pedigree is up for sale uh, yeah. for six hundred twenty thousand dollars is a relative bargain in the world yeah. of race cars, and I think that that is over half a mil. Yeah, it's a pretty serious for a race car, car that you're not going to drive. No, I mean this is the thing. You go and you'll do Dakar in this if you want to. Oh, like, yeah, I if you want to. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah, I, I'm not. If I buy this car, it is a very bespoke piece of machinery, and I think it's absolutely phenomenal. They are pretty incredible cars. Like they're designed to. If you watch them doing Dakar or Fink, something like that, they run across the desert at more than 100 k's an hour, and these each wheel working underneath yes. the car and the body perfectly flat. Yeah. And they do it for hours on end. Yeah. It's brutal. Well, so you look at like Baja. 1, yeah. 000, well, yeah, which is the I really saw the one. Ranger that yeah. they did for that, uh, like in person. Well, that was, that's that slow, was, that thing. Yeah. yeah, I know, but the setup in there and what they did to it. Yeah. These trophy trucks are the open class. Like these are the Formula One of off-road racing. Um, it's very, very cool. So if you have $620,000, uh, I do recommend purchasing this because it probably will go quite quickly. Let us know how you're purchasing yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, is it on Easy Finance? <laughs> Afterpay, let us know. We're very curious. Could you buy one of those through the Car Expert Help Me feature? I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. I don't know if this brings <laughs> to a dealer, but um, we'll... We'll hit up the guys that help me car expert and see if they can uh, help us out with that. Um, that pretty much brings us to the end this week, guys. Uh, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Did we have any questions? Oh, we did have a question. Oh, Actually, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, I've got it here. Uh, on your new iPhone Yes, on my 15. new iPhone, yes. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, Spotify player 6906 yep. uh, on YouTube asked, what's the best midsize SUV that is petrol and has enough space for five adults and under $65,000? Okay, I'm going to start. Go and on. I'm going to say a top spec Kia Sportage with the two litre petrol engine. With five adults on board, it's going to feel a little bit slow, but it does have a nice big spacious interior for a mid-size SUV. And I quite like the way it drives. And seven year unlimited kilometre warranty. So excellent. That's very helpful. Jade, what, what's, what do you think? I'm going the Honda CRV, the new one. Um, haven't been able to test drive it yet. So can't speak about how nice We're it is. We're driving it in two weeks, I think. Um, yes. Uh, but... The inside looks very spacious, very plush. I think you can definitely comfortably fit. Um, five adults is the it's criteria. It's got a seven-seat option as well. So. Yes. Yeah, I don't know how many adults you can fit. We'll have to yeah. try and work that Put out. Put James in the back seat. Yeah, how many Scott Collies can you fit in the third row of the Honda CRV? <laughs> I can guarantee you it's none. I'm sure it's half. <laughs> it's a point. It's zero point something. Yeah, it's like... yeah. Uh, yeah, what about you? Oh, I go Mitsubishi Outlander. I think that's a... Yeah. Pretty easy win. That Can you one. get a Feb for that price? I don't think you get a Feb. 65 for that. will get you a base Feb, I yeah. think, yeah. But I wouldn't bother with that. No, you just get, just the get petrol. petrol, I think, yeah. for that. Yeah, no. So, yeah, um, something like an Outlander and X-Trail are probably right on the money. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. Well, there you go. So, thanks for reminding me of the question. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts, guys? Uh, Bathurst coming up. Yes. If you're an Australian car enthusiast, we're approaching Christmas, basically. Yeah, basically. It's, this is um, the race that stops the nation of petrol cars. Car cuts. race, yeah. Yes, we'll bring you uh, a full report. No, we won't bring you a full <laughs> no, report. No, we won't. I, I wish that uh, our podcast Sean lasted. will come back to the office smelling like petrol and rubber and yeah. everything race-related. No, unfortunately, I'm not going this oh, you're year. you're not going this no, year. I'm a little disappointed. So. This is sacrilegious. No, so I will be on the couch, uh, planned on the couch all day on uh, that Sunday for that one. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Jade, it's great to have you back here yes, again. Yes, great to be back. Don't forget, get your tickets, 14th of October. Want to see you there. And don't forget to vote as well on the same day, otherwise you'll be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Very important, just uh, public service announcements here. Um, all right, guys, well, thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank all of you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Sean. Bye.